Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for that introduction. It sounds like you're talking about someone else, but thank you anyway. Uh, Lieutenant General Zahirul Islam, uh, Major General Khalid Amin Jafri, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, especially those who have come from afar, welcome to Pakistan and to this uh, interesting <coughs> seminar. I wish to thank the Center for Global and Strategic Studies. I wish to thank the Center for Global and Strategic Studies for inviting me to share my thoughts with you at this seminar on the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, specifically Pakistan's role in regional peace and prosperity. I commend the Center for bringing together such a distinguished group of scholars from Pakistan and the SEO region to deliberate on the future trajectory of the organization and Pakistan's place in the emerging scheme of things. There will be a lot of discussions on SEO and my colleague who deals with, who is the additional secretary and the national coordinator for SEO, uh, Dr. Dr. Zahur, he will be talking about in detail about Pakistan's work within the SEO. So since I've been asked to talk about the role of Pakistan in regional peace and prosperity, I'll try, I shall try to focus on that. I believe the topic that's before us is, it, is both timely and pertinent. The world around us is changing and the region we are inhabiting is transforming. Being shaped by inexorable forces of change, the inevitable momentum of history, Four aspects of this generational shift are noteworthy. One, the world is transitioning from a unipolar world to one of multipolarity. There is still a superpower that remains on the scene, and that is the United States. But there are very strong powers in our region that are coming up, and that they are there to stay, China and Russia. Competition and cooperation between great powers of our time is determining the global, particularly the Asian, geopolitical landscape. Two, the economic epicenter of the world is shifting eastwards with the growing economies of the developing world and their budgeting populations set to play perhaps a pivotal role in driving demand and growth. Three, Transformative and disruptive technologies are changing and are set to permeate even further our lives in fundamental ways, both positively and even negatively, if I may say so. These changes invariably impact politics amongst nations. A case in point is the social media space, where perceptions are created and changed, and sometimes even destroyed and have the dangerous power of crafting and speaking to their own realities. This is a challenge that we are confronted with on a daily basis and a challenge that we need to know how to deal with or sometimes even ignore. Finally, international norms that have been put in place since World War II are perhaps under greater stress than any other time since 1945 many times under siege from the very architects of this framework. A sense of uncertainty has supplanted the predictability of yesteryears. We are living, it seems, in a moment of history when an older order is breaking down and involving, evolving into something different, something new, which has yet to take place and to take shape. This is time for great opportunity but also one of great peril. Pakistan, ladies and gentlemen, have been described, has been described by many serious observers of international affairs as a global pivotal state, a state whose policies and positions resonate far beyond its frontiers and whose fortunes impact the international community in profound ways. This is not just because of our location at the, at the confluence of South and Central Asia and the Middle East and China. This is not just because of our own inherent strengths and potentials, the fact that we are a nation of 200 million and a leading member of, of the non-aligned <coughs> world as well as the Islamic bloc. 
And this is not just because Pakistan affords the vast Eurasian landmass over land connectivity and most economical access to warm waters. I believe it is all these factors combined. The whole is more than the sum of its parts. As a pivotal state, Pakistan has a key role to play in regional peace and prosperity, inscripting the blueprint of a more hopeful tomorrow, and we are committed to do so. At the cost of blood and treasure, Pakistan is perhaps the only country to have successfully pushed back the tide of terrorism and extremism and continues to do so. Operation Zarbi Azam and Radul Fasad have achieved measurable successes in breaking the backbone of terrorists. Even as an action action plan, the consensual blueprint for eliminating terrorism and extremism is in full swing. Peace and security has largely returned to our towns and villages. Under the leadership of Prime Minister Imran Khan, Pakistan is well poised to assume a greater role as a responsible and responsive member of the international community. The recent Pakistan-India tensions are illustrative. The Pulwama attack of 14 February, tragic as it was, was perpetrated by a Kashmiri young person abused repeatedly at the hands of Indian occupation forces and maltreated and disillusioned by the incessant, incessant high-handed repression. Unfortunately, without any investigation and in the middle, being in the middle of an election campaign, the finger was pointed at Pakistan. Prime Minister Imran Khan immediately took control of the narrative and offered cooperation if actionable intelligence was made available. Perhaps under domestic political compulsions, as I said, India reacted by blaming Pakistan without much evidence, ignoring our offers of assistance and ratcheting up war hysteria. The penetration of our airspace and subsequent bombing of sovereign Pakistani territory on 26 February was a blatant violation of the UN Charter, norms of interstate state conduct and international law. Feeding Indian public false narratives about death, destruction and casualties where there have been none and seeking to establish a new norm of trampling our sovereignty whenever it felt um, it wanted to do so. This happened. And of course, this is where we saw the social media playing a very important role a very important negative role in many ways as well. In the face of an unacceptable aggression, Pakistan reacted with reason, restraint and resolve. On 27 February, our Air Force, while remaining in its own airspace, targeted non-military installations in Indian-occupied Kashmir, deliberately avoiding human loss and collateral damage. The reason was that message had to be sent that we cannot accept aggression. There has to be some response. Two Indian military jets were shot down when they violated Pakistan's space uh, a second time in as many days. And one of the pilot down, downed uh, of the Indian Air Force. Addressing the nation for the second time, Prime Minister Imran Khan demonstrated statesmanship when he reiterated his offer of cooperation in investigating the Pulwama attack and resolving issues through dialogue. The Indian uh, pilot who was captured was returned as a gesture of peace and to de-escalate the tensions. Throughout this period, Pakistan remained actively engaged with all our friends and partners, the P5 countries and the United Nations to apprise them of the evolving situation. Our objective was to, to demonstrate that Pakistan was only interested in peace and Pakistan wanted to move on the peace agenda that the government had very clearly illustrated. We, also, we are grateful to the international community for playing a positive role in averting a possible, difficult, somewhat catastrophic situation. Any confrontation between two nuclear-armed states 
that also happen to be neighbors is not only unthinkable, <coughs> it is completely unacceptable. In recognition of this reality, the Prime Minister has repeatedly called for dialogue, assuring India that Pakistan will take two steps towards peace if India took one. In fact, Pakistan has taken all the steps and many steps to prove its point. We have taken confidence building measures, including the opening of the Kartarpur corridor for Yatris. And since the flare up of tensions, we have taken steps to de escalate, including, besides the prompt return of the captured pilot, the return of a High Commissioner to his post in New Delhi after consultations in Islamabad, re establishment of, week, of weekly military contacts reinitiating consultations on the Kartarpur corridor and resumption of train service between our two countries. We believe that it is only moving on a, on a peaceful path that the two countries like Pakistan and India can coexist in peace. Elections in India cannot determine the future of this region. It is Pakistan and India, the thinking people in Pakistan and India who have to decide how peace is to be retained and how the people of this region can benefit from the, from the economic and, and prosperity and development. Ladies and gentlemen, the international community must dwell soberly and with all seriousness on the causes of this escalation and what it entails. In South Asia, the festering Kashmir dispute, the continued occupation of Jammu and Kashmir and the brutal repression of Kashmiri's right to self-determination granted to them by the UN Security Council remains the biggest obstacle to enduring peace. And today, as the escalation goes down, the repression in, in Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir increases many fold. Where there were 700,000 troops, 40,000 more have been poured in. And the, and the objective is to crush completely the people of Jammu and Kashmir in their peaceful, in their peaceful demonstration of getting their right to self-determination. The UN High Commission on Human Rights and the UK parliamentary reports have exposed the true nature of Indian brutalities and the suffering of the Kashmiri people. These reports are a clear vindication of our position and stance. Only recently, at the opening of the Human Rights Council, the the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights again reiterated and expressed deep concern on how the rights of the, of the Kashmiri people were being suppressed and the people of Kashmir were undergoing inhumanities and brutalities of a, of a level that perhaps were not seen before. Ladies and gentlemen, on our eastern border, Afghanistan has been in throes of conflict for the past 40 years, first, uh, may I just sort of retract, with both the people of occupied Jammu and Kashmir and Pakistan itself, India has shunned dialogue and chosen instead to employ force to decimate young generations of Kashmiris and extinguish their yearning for freedom or their yearning to breathe freely. This policy is myopic and self-defeating. It is our earnest hope that our eastern neighbor will have the, sen the good sense to avoid mutually assured destruction and engage in a result-oriented dialogue for resolution of the dispute in line with UN Security Council resolutions and the just aspirations of the people of occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Pakistan stands for peace and will work for peace because peace is our need and, the peace, and peace is the need of the people of Pakistan and the people of South Asia, and the people all over. Ladies and gentlemen, on our Eastern labor, in the context of working for peace, we've also been working with Afghanistan. Afghanistan, unfortunately, has been in the throes of conflict for the past 40 years, first as a final frontier of the Cold War, and subsequently as a theater of what has been called the War on Terror. If besides Afghanistan, this geopolitical vortex has ensnared any other country, it is Pakistan. We have suffered because refugees, radicalization, drugs, gun culture and lawlessness 
has been accompanied, accom accompaniments of the Afghan war economy. After long years of fighting, we are gratified that an international consensus is emerging over our long-held view that there is no military solution to the Afghan problem and that only an intra-Afghan reconciliation can pave the way for lasting peace in the country. In the shape of U.S.-Afghan talks, we are happy to see a nascent peace process finally taking shape. We want the intra-Afghan dialogue to be inclusive, to be comprehensive, and we work towards this end. For this process to be durable, it is important that it be eventually owned and led by the Afghans themselves. It is the Afghan people who have to decide for themselves the future they want for their country, for their people, and together for, for the region. For it to be successful, it is important that all Afghanistan neighbors and stakeholders, including China, US, and Russia, are on board. And of course, we need to keep the spoilers at bay. Pakistan has played a facilitative role in bringing the Taliban to the table. That is the best we could do, and that's what we are doing. We have and will continue to lend all possible assistance in facilitating an Afghan-led, afghan owned process of peace and re reconciliation. We will continue to be a part of any and every peace process that seeks to aim, advance the aim of stability and prosperity in Afghanistan. On our part, besides several development projects, we've imparted education to some 50,000 Afghans in our universities and professional colleges. In collaboration with China, an elaborate program of, for Afghan capacity, build, capacity building has been devised under the rubric of the Afghanistan-Pakistan-China Practical Dialogue. And I thank our friend, the Chinese ambassador, who's here today for the work we do together in this regard. Given the long porous nature of the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan, Pakistan has taken the initiative of improving border management and fencing large portions of it. This, we hope, will not only provide security to both sides of the border, but will also be an important CT action. Ladies and gentlemen, peace and stability in Afghanistan would make the dream of regional connectivity and, sub and consequent prosperity a reality. In Pakistan, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, the flagship project of President, Xi, President Xi's Belt and Road Initiative is fast reaching fruition. By slashing distances and cutting costs and catalyzing region-wide connectivity, the corridor will help translate Pakistan's geostrategic location into geoeconomic dividends. In the next phase, a series of special economic zones are being poised to establish along the length of Pakistan. The size of our domestic market and prospects of enhanced connectivity is already attracting interest from third countries. I take this opportunity to thank China and for its friendship for its time-tested friendship that we've had with China. We thank China for always standing by Pakistan, as Pakistan stands by China in its moments of need. Together, we make, as they say, one is one, but ele two is eleven. Two ones are eleven. <laughs> with, chi with China, we do a lot of work for peace, for development, and we appreciate the work that the Belt and in the Road Initiative has done for the developing world in the context of development. Ladies and gentlemen, Pakistan is poised to play a pivotal role in regional peace and prosperity. And the elements of this are one, Pakistan wants peace and stability and has to be treated as a factor of stability within the region. Two, Pakistan has many strengths that are recognized globally and that the government is focused on and building upon so that this pivot of strength becomes a pivot of strength for the entire region and globally as well. Three, our economic and trade potential is immense and has been further underscored by CPEC and it, as it offers to all its neighbors opportunities for connectivity 
and opportunities for growth and opportunities for trade. Uh, four, cultural connectivity is an important aspect of what we want to do within the region as well. And in this context, the government has, has started this important project on opening up. There has been announcements of greater visa flexibility and tourism opportunities being offered to the rest of the world. We have, within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, also launched and an important initiative called the Gandhara Forum, which will help the world come and see for itself the treasures we have as Gandhara art and especially Buddhist heritage. We've also launched within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs an important initiative on science diplomacies, diplomacy, which we feel is an important area for connectivity to take place and where we can learn from each other especially in the context of South-South cooperation, and also with developed countries as well. Possibilities and, thing, and, uh, and innovative ideas that will help development to take place. And of course, Pakistan is a, as an important, as an important entrant to the SCO, thanks to all the support that was given by all our friends and partners in the Central Asian Republics, Russia and China. We feel ourselves to be in part of a very important group which has the potential to look at issues of peace and security, of trade, of addressing issues of terrorism comprehensively. Through organizations such as SEO, which affords regional states large and small a platform to share the dividends of prosperity on the basis of equality, mutual respect and mutual interest, we are destined to be invested completely into a more connected and secure future, embedded firmly in the rich tapestry of Eurasian community of nations. I thank you for your kind attention, and I hope you will have a very successful seminar. Thank you.